Out of the mists of the past, out of the far past, out of the near past of only yesterday, has come our great civilization of today, a man-made world full of the evidence that man progresses by building knowledge on knowledge, bit by bit, progresses by building on the learning, the experience, the culture of the past. Our alphabet, for example, a priceless heritage from the ancients. From it, we created our written language. From the Romans came our laws, basis of modern judicial practice. And the Romans taught us how to build roads, arteries of civilization. The Greeks profoundly influenced our architecture. Printing, an inheritance from the Chinese, has made possible learning for the millions. From Egypt of long ago came the principles of farming, the foundation of modern agriculture. So, building on the past, step by step, our civilization has risen until man has been dwarfed by his own accomplishments. Building, 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 miracles of achievement in every field, and all stand as a monument to the principles of progress contributed by ancient cultures. While most of our ancestors were skin-clad barbarians in the old world, there lived in middle America a mighty people, the Maya. And the Maya, uninfluenced by any other civilization, rose to a greatness of their own. Like all the other inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere, the remote ancestors of the Maya had crossed Bering Strait from Asia. Nomads, wanderers, perhaps with fire, but without tools. These first Americans drifted southward, looking for better hunting. Alongside the Rocky Mountains, through the Great Plains, eventually into Mexico, into fertile upland valleys where they learned to cultivate edible plants. With the development of agriculture, the wanderers settled. There was leisure, time between crops. And leisure gives man time to think time to develop a civilization such as the Maya evolved. In the jungles of northern Guatemala and southern Mexico, the Maya were building immense stone cities 1,500 years ago. These magnificent cities are ruins now, victims of warm rains and the strangling tropic vegetation. The Maya civilization itself is gone, but it has left us important lessons. The Maya developed all of the great principles of culture independently of European or Asiatic civilizations. The Maya had their great lawmakers. They could have given us laws. The Maya, too, could have given us a written language. In all the history of the world, only five or six original systems of writing have been developed. One of these was the Maya system. The Maya were magnificent artists. See the exquisite detail, the well-planned conception of their carving. No people in the history of the world knew more than the Maya about perspective and the drawing of the human figure. They were skillful engineers, great architects. See the clever joints, the masterly stone cutting on this old Maya building. But the greatest achievement of the Maya was in science. This is their zero sign, invented a thousand years before it was conceived by the Hindus who gave it to us. With their zero sign and these simple bar and dot numerals, the Maya went far into higher mathematics. With their zero and their written language, the Maya worked out the most complete astronomical knowledge of any people before the 16th century. They created the most accurate calendar man has ever devised. The Maya could have given us much, could have given us a great culture. And the Maya have given us much. From their agriculture, we have inherited many important foods. Ancient America gave us corn, beans, 
peanuts, melons, even pineapples are native to the American tropics. Ancient Americans gave us peppers, tomatoes, and they gave us potatoes too. And chocolate, the Aztec Emperor Moctezuma drank it every day. Columbus saw tobacco the very day he landed in the New World. Ancient America is close beside our dinner table. Here, an all-American menu, soup to nuts. And every bit of it, an ancient American product. That brings the past pretty close. In 1521, when Hernando Cortes conquered Mexico, Aztec merchantmen pulled their busy boats through Xochimilco, the place of flowers near the city of Mexico, 400 years ago. And still they do, floating over the same quiet waters as they did long centuries ago. The same Aztec boatmen, the same place of flowers, Xochimilco. Ancient songs still echo over the mirroring waters, where the tall, slim willows lift spires like Lombardy poplars. 400 years ago, the Spaniards conquered Middle America. On shattered Indian nations, they built a great colonial empire. And this was its capital, Antigua, once a mighty Spanish city in the pleasantest valley in Guatemala. This was the capital of all the mainland Americas from Mexico to Peru, 1543 to 1775. Antigua was gracious with age when our 13 little colonies fought for their freedom. Stately, proud, alive, too proud. Time and again, earthquakes hurled it to the ground. Time and again, it was rebuilded in its magnificence. Then even the fierce Spanish dons gave up and left it, their proud and ruined city. Today, Antigua is a city of life and a city of ghosts. Its population of thousands lead everyday lives amid the colonial ruins. Even the Indians have returned to take up their lives in the shadow of humbled Spanish grandeur. For long years, there were war clouds, clouds of Spanish conquest over the smiling valleys of Middle America. Eventually, peace, quiet people, quiet lands, peaceful lands, hard-working, industrious people. In 1492, there were perhaps two million Maya. Today, there are still at least two million pure-blooded Maya. Lacking only the magnificent independent civilization of the past, they live as their ancestors lived, tilling their fields, their corn and beans and potatoes. And meet in their ancient marketplaces, as they have met for centuries, buying and selling their crops and their handiwork. The Indians dress today as their people dressed a thousand years ago. They even sit the same today. Notice the upside down position of their feet. That's the way their people sat a thousand years ago. See, the feet of this old, old Maya image are folded under in the self same way. Behold their magnificent textiles textiles born of instinct and love of design. And they are still made the way their ancestors wove and embroidered so many centuries ago. Before Christ was born, Maya artists shaped beautiful clay pottery, 
shaped it with their clever hands, with their careful hands, and Mother Earth. And they still do the same clever hands, the same mute clay. Look at them in Chinautla, little Indian village not far from the busy streets of Guatemala City, these modern ancients. They lay their fires in the old way, baking their pots, as they have been baked always in these smiling lands. And then, pick a back to market. Past and present are brother and sister in middle America. In terms of geography, middle America is a land of infinite variety. Mountains, broad valleys, magnificent lakes, many rivers, modern cities, lush lowlands, unbelievably fertile, where grow fantastically beautiful tropical flowers. Middle America, tremendously rich in resources the world needs. Mountains hoarding gold and silver and copper, iron, marble, timber, hundreds of thousands of acres. Water power, lots of it. Wool in the cool highlands, the broad upland valleys. Coffee from the hill country for millions of breakfast tables. And transportation, trains to carry products to market, hurrying along under incredible tropic skies, through the hill country, through the low country, to the ports. Middle America, rich in potentialities for trade. Modern Middle America's most important contribution to the world's market basket, its greatest single industry, is the banana, green gold of Middle America. Bananas are old residents of the New World, but not natives. In 1510, more than 400 years ago, Father Tomas de Berlanga, a foresighted Dominican, brought the first banana root to this hemisphere. Precious roots from the Canary Islands to the West Indies. There, on the island of Española, he planted, and there he saw grow the first American bananas. Then, Father Berlanga took his great new fruit to the mainland, to Central America, to Panama. Four centuries later, from this humble beginning came a gigantic industry. U.S. enterprise and Central American sun, rain, and soil now produce more than 75 million stems of bananas a year. Bananas don't grow wild. They must be cultivated. The jungle cleared, rootstocks planted in the fertile soil. New plantings must be cleaned of undergrowth, else young shoots will smother. Growth is magic here. The shoot leaps up, grows quickly. At three months, it is sturdy. At six months, leaves spread wide. Within a year and a few months, full-grown fruit on a lofty tree. And from each tree, shoots spring up, which also will bear. A banana tree perpetuates itself several generations at a time. The lowland farms are endless, watered, tended, but sometimes tropic suns will dry the land too much. Then man turns on the rain, tailor-made weather. Great pumps lift water out of rivers, ditches, throwing it far, throwing it in overlapping circles hundreds of feet across the farms. Tons of water breaking into spray, feeding the thirsty leaves, feeding the growing fruit. Bananas grow upside down, pointing their fingers at the sky, dangling their purple buds. Cutting crews seek out the best, one stem to a tree. Keen blades bring down the great bunches of green fruit. 
Down comes the treetop, down the heavy fruit. On the sturdy shoulders of men, bananas start their long journey to markets in far places. Gathered in tractor-drawn carts, the stems are wrapped in blankets, cushioned against bruises. Laid gently by for a quick trip to the railroad. Banana trains hurry them to port in Honduras, in Guatemala, in Costa Rica, in Panama, in Jamaica, and many other tropical countries. Speeding to ship's side at such points as Puerto Barrios, typical tropical port. At a dozen middle American ports, ships pick up their green cargo. Endless trains bring endless loads. From the cars, the green flood pours into the conveyors, steadily, ceaselessly. And into the yawning holes, the green tide goes, millions upon millions of bananas a year. Then, over the blue Caribbean, over the Gulf of Mexico, along the Atlantic lanes, the white fleet goes. In the USA, ports such as New Orleans, New York, Boston, many others, speed the green fruit from the ships by thousands, by millions. Men and machines speed them to trains and trucks. A mammoth industry has grown from Father Berlanga's humble immigrant roots. Middle America sends bananas to the world. And from the hot lowlands too, from the jungles of North Guatemala and Southern Yucatan, another multi-million dollar industry, chicle. Chewing gum from the sap of a hardwood tree. Airplanes fly it out of the jungles, shuttling back and forth to the ports. Sturdy freight planes hauling in foodstuffs and heavy machinery and even mules bringing out blocks of raw chicle. Soggy fields cannot stop them, these modern covered wagons of a new frontier. The skyways become the highways of middle America to market, to market through the clouds, to waiting ships, ships to carry chicle to busy factories, to the ultimate consumer. Chicle from middle America, another important industry, the result of cooperation between North American enterprise and middle American resources. Trade requires understanding. Understanding of the past, understanding of the present. For example, some shippers in the USA are losing trade in Latin America partly because they don't know how to pack. Now there are reasons. Middle America has narrow gauge railroads. They must combat tremendous natural obstacles. And Middle America has twisting highways cut from the mountainsides and almost no side roads at all. On these trails, the standard conveyance is a man, or sometimes a mule, and a mule carries only 200 pounds, 100 pounds on a side. The men, too, carry prodigious loads, but they also have limitations. Too often, North American shippers load enormous cases, heavy steel drums, or heavy crates onto a steamer and send them to Latin America. Often the inland merchant cannot get his merchandise unless it is repacked in hundred pound loads for the mules. 
you've got to know your market. Trade requires understanding. And people too. People require understanding. Why do people act as they do? Why do they buy, sell, think as they do? Because of the past, because of long tradition, because of training, the long years behind them. Their markets have a human factor which demands a knowledge of their habits, their past. In middle America, three kinds of people must be understood. First, the natives, the Indians who were there thousands of years before the coming of the white man. Then, the peoples of mixed bloods. And finally, the Europeans, many of them descendants of the Spanish explorers who have no Indian blood at all. Natives, mixed bloods, whites, we must understand them all. We must understand their way of life. If it is not entirely our way, then we must take care to recognize how important is the past in the lives of all middle Americans. Consider the problem of selling these people salt, for example. No matter how pure it is, many middle American Indians don't want to buy white salt. They want gray salt. That's because the salt they've always had, that their ancestors had, is gray, evaporated from ancient salt flats, such as this one in Guatemala. The earth, wet with salt water, is carried uphill to the dripping frames. The salt water, which drips from the wet earth, is collected in jugs, taken to ovens, and evaporated over fires. Then, the damp salt which remains is poured into molds and set in the sun to dry into hard cakes. Each cake contains enough of the mud of the salt flats to make it gray. Hence, to these people, salt is gray. And naturally, gray salt is what they want to buy. It is the past throwing its shadow over the living habits of middle America. Strong in all middle America, the influence of the past is strongest in these high, remote mountains of northwest Guatemala. Here live the Quiche Indians, part of the great Maya people, independent, uncompromising, indomitable. The Quiche have the past at their elbows. Even the ruins of their ancient cities are close to them in the highlands, remains of a past that ceaselessly affects their thoughts and actions. The Quiche still celebrate one of the world's oldest and most unusual religious ceremonies, the ritual of the broken pots. Never before filmed, these scenes were shot by a Tulane University cameraman. The ceremonies take place once each 260 days by the ancient Maya Quiche calendar on the day known to them as Washa Kipbats, which means eight monkey. It is deeply religious, tremendously important. On this day, all the Indians of Mamostenango must come back to their town to seek the protection of their ancient gods for another 260 days. For what they are about to do before their Quiche gods, they first propitiate the Christian god in the village church of Mamostenango. Then, out of the Christian church, out to the hills of broken pots. All year, they have saved their broken bowls and cups and plates. Carefully, they have gathered the fragments. And now on this sacred day, they come to this sacred place, bearing the broken pieces to place upon a burning altar. Their own priests are here to make divinations from the fragments of broken vessels. And their altars are here, hundreds of sacred altars, hundreds of sacred fires to the Maya Quiche gods of old. All 
All day long the priests pray, the fires burn, clouds of incense rise. On the tops of these hills lie the newly broken pots put here this year. Beneath them are last year's sherds. Lower still are those of the year before. Down there, in the dark of the earth, lies history. History which can be uncovered and studied. Each fragment has its place in the long story. Bit by bit, a narrative takes shape as probers of the past assemble the fragments and reconstruct the American yesterday. Institutions are grappling with the past in the interests of today and tomorrow. Among them is the Tulane University of Louisiana in New Orleans, geographically closest to Middle America. Tulane's Middle America Research Institute was launched by a New Orleans businessman who believed that a scientific study of Middle America, past and present, would further cultural relations between these peoples and the United States. Already Tulane and the other groups have discovered much, but there is much more to be learned. And so the work goes on. They are learning from exploration, from geography, from Middle America's many peoples. They are learning from such highly specialized studies as Palmer dermatoglyphics and physical anthropology and from the archaeologists who are digging away at the oldest story, uncovering the shining past of the Americas. We are learning lessons that can bring about a closer understanding between the Americas, lessons that may help us solve the problems of our own time. A study of the Maya, for example, is mankind's opportunity to learn the story of why great civilizations fall. Do they grow so complex that their own weight pulls them down? Until it passed its peak, the Maya civilization was never conquered by any nation. Yet it crumbled, and the Spanish conquistadores found only the shell of a great civilization. Why? What did happen to the Maya? Was their culture undermined by the infiltration of a neighboring people? Were they economically strangled by a militaristic Aztec empire? Or did they simply reach the end of their capabilities, their limit of progress? Yes, what did happen to the Maya? And more important, can the same things happen to us? The answer lies in the past. For as always, understanding of the past is the key to the future, and understanding is the key to cordial relations between peoples. The people of Middle America are good neighbors. From them, we have learned much. And from these smiling lands, we can learn much more if we have the will and the courage to understand.